Hey everyone, this is Mike with the One Stop Co-op Shop, and today I'm doing a preview of Rove, an upcoming boss battler, dungeon crawl, tactical combat adventure game. And as always, we don't accept or take any payment for our crowdfunding coverage. We just want to help you make an informed decision. And if you like the content on the One Stop Co-op Shop, consider supporting us through Patreon. You get early access to our videos and exclusive videos every month you can't see anywhere else. You can also listen to our podcast for reviews and design discussions, or join the conversation and come say hi on our Discord. So like I said at the outset, Rove is an adventure game with a narrative campaign with branching paths and choices, and you'll be going through different scenarios, which are very much combat focused. This is uh, similar to maybe Tales from the Red Dragon Inn or Gloomhaven, but with even less exploration than Gloomhaven, you're not like opening up doors and things. You'll be on maps in this map book, fighting different waves of enemies with different objectives. In this one I'm playing, which is the beginning of one of the adventure paths, so a very early scenario. Uh, you're just trying to defeat the boss over here. But in other scenarios, you'll be protecting NPCs, trying to survive, chasing people, that kind of stuff. You have this quest book that has narrative introductions for the scenarios and also gives you special rules and objectives and that kind of stuff. And in the prototype, you've got one book for the map itself and a separate book for the activations of the enemies and tracking what activation they're on and what round it is and those kind of things. Then you have two to four hero characters and the prototype they sent me, there are five in total. They each have some ongoing actions they can use every turn, basic actions, plus some card-based special actions, and they can also have items and inventory and things. And like most dungeon crawlers and battle games, you're trying to keep yourself alive uh, before time runs out. In this scenario, I have eight rounds to win, and before both your characters are knocked out. Combat in the game is somewhat deterministic. Attacks will tell you how much damage they'll deal, like this ambush does too, and what its range is, which is two to three. But then you'll roll a D8 die and check it against your character's affinities, which will change as they level up and class up. You've got uh, two dim symbols, these little moons that are nothing, will not affect the attack negatively or positively. And then uh, some other symbols, like here, if I get this purple or this blue one, it would be plus one damage. Uh, by the way, the dice they sent me are from an earlier prototype, so the symbols won't quite match up, but the colors will. <laughs> and in this case, uh, the fire red symbol, or where is it? Uh, this gray symbol would be minus one, so I'd do one damage with ambush or three with the bonus. The enemies will be doing similar kinds of stuff. They also roll for their attack. They have a life value, special abilities and such. And their activation is somewhat predictable. At the beginning of each enemy activation, phase except the first you're going to roll a die which has three ones two twos and one three and you move their little token that many spaces so like when they're activating the first action you have a 50 percent chance that they'll activate the second action next and then a 50 percent chance they'll activate the third action but they might surprise you and jump farther forward and then they just wrap around as they keep on activating one more big thing in the game are ether dice, which are kind of like the magic of the world. So a ton of your action cards will give you an ether dice, sometimes of a specific type, sometimes you just roll randomly for it. And then other action cards will cost a certain number of dice, like this bell tolls here says that it costs two. So to activate that, you have to have built up that many dice in your ether pool, and then you move them over to your infused ether. And that'll let you activate the card. And by the way, these cards also tend to flip over as you use them and even flip other cards. So you actually have uh, twice as many abilities as it seems. And while dice are an infused ether, they can actually be used by some of your weapons and other items to get extra bonuses, which takes them out entirely. So you kind of have this sort of a life cycle, if you will, of ether dice, where you gain them from actions into your pool, you spend them to do your super attacks, and then you uh, use them to activate items. But how rounds go is the heroes will activate and then the enemies will all activate. On a hero's turn, which you can take in any order you want, you can do up to two of your basic actions and also resolve up to one of your cards. And additionally, each hero has some reaction cards and you can use one of those once per turn whenever it applies. So like this draw from blood one says if an enemy suffers three or more damage within five range, then I could use my action. This would flip over and I'd get a bonus. In this case, I would get to roll another ether die to power up my abilities. And those are kind of the basics. Let's just jump right in. And then at the end of the uh, play, I'll give my impressions of the game. So let's try out some Rove. All right. So in this scenario, I have my true scale, which is sort of a tank, but he also has like mind control abilities to mess with the enemies and move them around. He's uh, down here. And then I've got my shadow piercer, who's a archer range person mainly. But as they uh, class up, they're actually going to become kind of a close range, like claw Wolverine style fighter. So uh, that's kind of fun. But right now they're just an archer. 
And I'm facing off. This is based on player count. You can see some spots where I didn't spawn enemies because I only have two heroes. I've got two Xenixes, which are uh, these guys. They're armored. They can go on to obstacles to so even start on like some rock outcroppings here. And then I've also got a whole bunch of Kifas, which are these like flying bat creatures. This terrain they're on is open space, so only they can fly around in there. And then the big bad boss is this Grove guy over here. Uh, he's got eight lifetimes the number of rovers, which is 16 in this case. And we've also got an ether die on the board. These are ether nodes, and each of the scenarios I've played has at least one of them. And they have different effects. So this one, every time you end your turn within one space of it, you'll heal one, which is pretty nice. But additionally, a hero can spend one movement when they're next to it to suck it up and pull it into their own ether pool if they want to use it to fire off some cool ability. But enough about the board, let's uh, meet our characters and get to our first turn. Let's start with our friend the Archer, maybe. So the Shadow Piercer, basic abilities, remember you can use two on your turn. Bound, to move up to three spaces. Brace gives them plus one range on their next ranged attack. Uh, ambush is a two to three range attack, or two to four with Brace for two damage. And then Renit heals one to an ally at range one to three. So it cannot be used on the Shadow Piercer themselves. If it could, it would have zero range. And then looking at their ability cards, I got to pick which side these started on. So I started with a two on their expensive side, the side you need to build up to. So my basic actions are Miasmic Arrow. I get to place one of these negative terrain tokens. The game lets you place tokens on the board and stuff uh, within zero to three range. And the Shadow Pierce's negative token will inflict minus two attack damage on anybody standing on it. So if I know somebody's about to hit me, I can use this to kind of shut down any of their abilities. And also that'll get me an ether die of that specific purple type. Encant puts one of my positive terrain tokens on my own space, which will give me plus one to all my attack. And also when I make an attack, I will heal myself one. And uh, both of these, by the way, are removed after they're used on a single attack. So that kind of sets me up for a healing thing. And it will get me a random ether die. That's what that symbol means. And then careful aim is a two to four range attack for two damage and also getting me an ether die. Not bad. So I'm thinking maybe I want to shoot a Kifa, but what are they about to do? They're about to move three to do a two damage attack within range one. That's what that symbol means. And then push uh, me after they hit me. How about the Xenixes? They're going to move three and also do a range one attack. So yeah, moving up into range of all of them seems like a bad idea. <laughs> so maybe the Shadow Piercer will do something different. Yeah, you know, I don't think I need to move at all if I use Brace to get plus one range and then use Careful Aim to shoot for range two to five. Yeah, then I can hit the guy from where I am. Oh, you know what? I forgot. We're supposed to each start with the indicated amount of ether, which is just a single one. So Shadow Piercers got blue, and we'll show them in a second. True Scale also got blue. Okay, so Shadow Piercer is doing a two damage attack, two to five range against the Akifa standing in the pit. This is going to flip in a second, but let me go ahead and resolve it. So I want to get a blue or a purple would be great. And I don't want to get a red or a gray. And that's a dim, which has no effect at all. So I'm just doing the flat two damage. Then I get another ether, which gets me another blue. And then this is going to flip to its devour prey side, which would cost three ether dice. I only have two. And this symbol, which is a, a common for the Shadow Piercer, means I would also have to use up one of my basic activations. This is a super powerful card. But I would jump four, which means you ignore uh, terrain in between. Then attack four damage, range one, ignoring armor. Then heal myself two. And what this symbol means, the little check and an ether symbol, means that if to pay this three cost, at least one of them was purple, I would get this bonus. In this case, healing myself three instead of two. Pretty cool, pretty cool. And I already have enough ether dice for bell tolls which is a three damage two to four range attack that would also leave one of my minus two uh, attack damage tokens there and if i use a blue which i would be doing it would be a four damage attack so i might just bell toll somebody uh, next turn i think all right so the key have five life each uh, they did send like little damage tokens and i think in the actual game they'll have some roll down dice but since nobody has more than six life except the boss i'm just uh, using dice so this guy's got three life left and what to do for my last basic action? I could ambush, but I'm not in range. I could move, but I'd get hit. Well, I think I can move a little bit because I certainly don't need to heal. So I'll bound. And when I say these guys are moving three, they're moving three. So yeah, if I go like, or if I go even here, they can hit me. Is that right? No, no. Uh, yeah, so if I go right there, yay, I'm slightly further ahead. <laughs> 
Okay, meanwhile, our friend, the True Scale, he's got Skitter to move four a little faster than the Archer. Seize is a great ability. This is uh, one of the mind control ones. Basically, the, the theme behind this guy is pretty wacky. He's like a lizard, but he's got a mind controlling insect sort of symbiotically attached to him. So uh, the insect is the seizing thing, and it can move an enemy within three spaces. One... Which is not as useful in this scenario. In some of the other scenarios I've played, they've had like a lot of traps and damaging terrain on the board. This one's not going to be too useful except to get people into or out of melee range. Uh, you can do a basic strike at one range for two damage, and he can heal himself one. Or this symbol means if he dims a purple die. Dimming means if you have that type of die in your ether pool, you can replace it with one of these dim dice. And it still functions exactly the same to pay for costs and things, but uh, it just doesn't count as that color anymore. So I could do that to heal myself too. All right, and then his cheaper abilities, we won't look at these yet, although actually he could do Sweeping Cleave already. He can do a Blast Step to jump up to three or five if he dimmed a red and then get a red himself. And Fire is the die he needs in his Infuse Pool Aether to have uh, used earlier to give himself plus one damage from his Stripped Blade item. So I'm kind of attracted to that one. Knock Senseless would hit somebody at range one, get a random ether, and put the fire terrain underneath the person. Every time someone ends their turn on fire, they take one damage. And then finally, Intrusive Thoughts, force one non-boss enemy within three range to perform two movement. And then the enemy takes one damage, and then I would get specifically a purple ether. Now, I do only have eight rounds, but I don't necessarily feel the need to hurry here, because all the enemies are going to come to us in a second. And then I can maybe do, like, my sweeping cleave or something. So let's just do the blast step. Uh, I'm not going to try to move so much that I'm in range of anybody. So <laughs> I might uh, barely move at all, I guess. Where can I blast step to? If I go here, that guy can get me. <laughs> if I go here, he can't. Am I going to blast step backwards? Sure. Because I think I have to resolve some kind of movement to actually get the bonus. Okay, then I'm going to get a red ether and flip it to traitorous thoughts. Wow, cost three, but I can have one enemy attack uh, another enemy next to it for five damage. That's pretty great. Yes, yeah, so I got my red ether, so that's two. Then he shall know. I think I'll skitter back to where I was and then do nothing for my last action. Because, again, I want to let them come to me for one round. This is going to be the boring round. Next round, action time. And that's the end of the hero turn, although I should note our reactions in case they come up this turn. So I can use one of these two per round member. The true scale has against the odds right now. Before they are attacked, they can get one defense, blocking one damage for that attack, and then get a random ether. Or after you attack, you can push somebody one or two spaces and get a random ether. Or sorry, push somebody one space that is within one or two spaces. And these will both uh, flip just like other cards. And Shadow Piercer, I think I already showed this one. If somebody gets hit for a ton of damage, they get an ether. Or if an enemy move, uh, ends a move adjacent to me, ooh, I can do a one damage attack against an enemy automatically and then roll for an ether. That's cool. But now we get to the enemy activation. And you go from top to bottom. So we're going to do the flying dudes, the armor dudes, and then the boss. And the first round, you don't roll for how they're going to change their activation. We'll start doing that at the beginning of the next enemy phase. So these guys are moving three and are trying to attack within range one. And if you can kind of see the numbers, they'll go in order. So we've got three, four, five, six with how I randomly did them. And you are allowed to move them however you like, as long as they are moving along the shortest path to the closest target. So in this case, it doesn't matter too much, but we can get them pretty close to ourselves. But I'll try to get them to be like near each other for a sweep or something. Okay, then the Xenixes are also moving three for a melee attack. Ooh, there we go. That's a good sweep opportunity. And then finally, the boss, the Grove, the only thing we actually have to kill, who has 16 life. During even rounds, he has three shields. So next round, I won't really want to attack him, but the round after that, that's fine. Okay, so he's going to do Grasping Tongue. He's going to move two, try to attack us within range three, and then he's going to apply this to himself. Ah, man. <laughs> so uh, this is one of those games. This is how prototypes tend to go, right? I didn't get a printed rule book, so I've been like running back and forth. I don't remember what the heck this uh, ter effect is. So we're just going to ignore that part for now, and I'll add a little note in the video of what awesome bonus he would have had. But yeah, for now, he's just moving two, and he would benefit from the Ether node, gaining one health back, but he has not been hurt yet. All right, that's one round. Things tend to be uh, pretty quick. So we're going into round two, which means the boss does have three armor this turn. And let's look at our most likely results. Okay, so the Kifas are probably going to do a stone fling. Moving two to get within range two for a three damage attack. It's going to be hard to avoid that. Uh, the Xenixes are most likely going to do a one move to get to range two to three and do a big uh, attack. This is area of effect. The uh, space that's highlighted is like the actual target space within two to three range. The rest don't have to be in that range. And the boss is going to try to move three more, doing a two damage attack, ignoring armor. 
I don't know if they can get close enough to us. I'm not going to worry about that one, although I guess they could jump four, but that should still be too far away. All right, so let's start with our tanky friend, the True Scale. I want him to get in here and use his cleave attack. Although these guys do have armor, so he's not likely to do a ton of damage, but hey, whatever. Right, so I'm going to start out with a Skitter to move up to four. And get right up in here in harm's way. And then I am going to use Sweeping Cleave. So it costs one ether, and I'm going to use the Fire, because now that'll be in my infused area and on a later attack. Uh, I don't think you can do it on this attack. I think it has to be a later attack. I can get plus one to my damage. And now these cards tend to flip multiple cards. I'm going to have to flip one that has this symbol. By the way, uh, the cards have these icons at the top. So these ones for this character, the true scale, are related to like his lizard self. While these ones, traitorous thoughts and such, are related to his insect self, <laughs> as it were. But yeah, so I'm doing an attack against both guys for two damage. You do roll separately. Red is good for me. Purple is good for me. Gray and blue, bad for me. All right, so I want red or gray. Purple? Oh, purple was also good. So that is... Oh, I didn't say I was attacking. Well, let's just go left to right. So that was three damage on that dude. Him down to two. And now on the armored one... Uh, that's a nothing. So two damage, but minus is one armor, so only one got through. Darn. So he's still got four left. Maybe I should ignore them and just fight the boss. Now, before I finish resolving that card, I do want to do the Shadow Piercer's Draw from Blood effect. Because Feral Sweep, all the enemies activating this turn are most likely going to do ranged attacks, so I don't think he'll get the chance to hit somebody who ends his turn next to him. So I'm going to use Draw from Blood, which just means the Shadow Piercer gets to roll another Aether, and it's a green... They've got three now for a big effect. And then this flips over, but they have used their one reaction for the turn, so they can't react again. Okay, but with that uh, interlude, let's return to Sweeping Cleave. So it's going to flip itself, and I have to flip another Lizard card. So I got Strange Chatter. And let's see. I don't think I'm going to do Coordinated Assault yet. That costs a lot, and it's both Lizard and Bug. So we'll switch it to Settling Groundwork to heal myself and get an Aether later. And I still have one basic attack left. Let's try to kill that Flying Dude. So I'm going to Strike for two damage. And this is during my attack, so I can see if I roll poorly, I need two damage to kill him. If I roll a blue or a gray, I can use my red infused ether to finish him off. So not a blue or gay, a green is nothing, which is enough. Ah, first person dead. All right, and that's it for the true scale. What's our Shadow Piercer going to do? All right, now they've got three ether, which is the max they can hold. Both the true scale and the Shadow Piercer can hold three. The more magical classes can hold more. So I want to use a uh, Devour Prey or Eviscerate here. And I guess Eviscerate makes more sense because I don't need to heal yet from Devour Prey. I'm sorry, they should be back. So let's, uh, how about this? Let's shoot our bow at the already injured dude and then maybe jump over and try to Eviscerate the rocky guy that the True Scale already hurt. So sure, okay, we'll do an ambush first. So this is a two attack, two to three range. This guy's got three life left, so not a huge chance we'll kill him, but there is a chance. We want green or purple is our sweet spot. Just yes, let's freaking go. Okay, so that's plus one damage. This guy is defeated. That was great. And then we are going to eviscerate, which is an extra cost member of exhausting a uh, basic action. So this is all that I'm going to get to do this turn. I'm doing two blue and a green into the infuse, which I don't think does anything special. Yeah, the, the stripped bow, which could give plus two range to an attack, needs a yellow, and I don't have one. Both characters, by the way, also have some potions, but these you can just use during your turn. Uh, they don't need any ether. All right, so I'm going to jump up to five, then attack for five at range one, and then, oh man, if I had used a purple, I would have done seven damage. <laughs> we'll have to try for that against the boss, maybe. Okay, and this one just flips itself to passing now, but let's go ahead and do this uh, jump and attack. All right, so I think I'm going to go and... Uh, Try to kill this dude, right? So it's five attack, but he's got uh, one defense. So it's four base, which is enough to kill him. I just need to not get what's his negatives. Uh, red or gray. I don't want red or gray. And that's a dim, which is nothing. Boom! I just took out half of your force in one turn. You suck. Uh, but again, <laughs> this is the first scenario after the tutorial. So this is uh, pretty, you know, this is supposed to be kind of simple stuff. All right, so that was great. Uh, I don't want to forget that the true scale does have a reaction, so I'm probably going to use my shield when one of these guys attacks me. And speaking of attacking, what are they doing? Kifa! Oh, moving two. Uh-oh, what's that? Uh, still doing a range attack at range two. They will attack for two instead of three, and then push me one. Oh, that's fine. Let's see, so that's number three. That's number six. So how far? They're moving two to get to range two. Oh, good. This one can't even reach us. So boop, boop, I guess, or I don't know, boop. And then this one, boop, boop, does get to the true scale. True scale will go and use against the odds. So they'll get to roll another ether die purple. Do they like purple? I think they do. 
And then uh, they get one shield against the attack, and this flips. So they've got one shield against two damage. So one incoming. A red or blue would mean it's nothing. Is that a red? Hey, that is a red. <laughs> Luck is on my side. Uh, but they still push me. Enemies try to maximize damage from pushing. Each space has to be uh, farther away. But I think uh, heroes can't be hurt by the open spaces. I think is what I remember. You can't like fall to your desk when you're a hero. So let's get pushed away that way. Okay, Mr. Xenix, what you up to? Also got a two. They're not doing anything I thought they would. So remember, two is uh, two out of six faces. So that's a one third chance. Okay, they're going to move to attack two. Okay, I should probably look up what this is. Dang it. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll go read. Hold on. All right, so I looked it up, and it is kind of like Flame, another token that they can put down on a space, and it'll actually stay there forever, and any time anyone ends their turn there, they heal one, so I can potentially use it against them. So I'll put one under the boss's current space, since they would have uh, left it there on their last turn. And then this guy's going to move to attack for two, put it on himself. He's going for my archer, and he's going to put down the thing. I'm attacking for two, I don't want blue or green. Oh, yellow is minus one. Awesome. So, God, I'm getting really lucky with this rolling. Uh, so that is only one damage, which means our Shadow Piercer is down to eight. And finally, what's the boss doing? We got a one. So he's going to move three and try to uh, hit two different people, kind of opposite sides. When they have multi-target attacks, they'll prioritize getting that many targets if they can, or the maximum number of targets, and then they'll prioritize closest uh, person. But they should be able to reach me at all. All right, on two, three. Now, <laughs> this would be a great place to get to. If I got there, I would heal two at the end of every turn. That could pretty much be like a, a null state where they can never kill me and I could just keep on bashing people. All right, and that takes us into round three, which means the boss does not have armor. Oh my god, Sonic Screech. The heck? <laughs> so the most likely result, although they could skip it, is to move two and then just do a giant blast attack for the two remaining flying dudes. This guy, Hail of Stones. One piercing damage against all enemies within three range. That's not terrible. How about the boss? He's probably going to jump and then do two damage to everyone. Oh, he just like dives on the ground and makes a big crash or power ball. Move the enemy farthest away within range of the following attack. X equal number of spaces moved with... Oh my god. So that could be five damage? What the heck? So there's multiple reasons not to be near each other this turn. So that they can't uh, hit us multiple times with the sonic screeches or this power dive. The power ball would be best if we were near the boss. Hmm. And I guess the real question is, should we try to put some damage on the boss? We need 16 to win. He has no armor this round. Or should we try to kill the last few people, especially the, uh, the little bat things are maybe easiest to finish off. Could do this strange chatter ability. Look, three damage. If I use a purple, which I would, because that's one of my two ether dice. Four damage, range two to three, and then I put my negative token, which for true scale, subtracts one from their attack if they're on that space, and they suffer one damage uh, when they attack on the space. So if the Kifa survives the attack, although I can probably just do a melee attack and finish him off. But man, should I just attack the boss? I mean, if I'm doing four or five damage, that's a quarter of his life with one go. It seems like a waste to just kill a little bad guy with it. So yeah, go big or go home. Let's uh, skitter for four. Okay, one, two, three. I can't get next to him. Well, we'll go here. And we'll do strange chatter with these. Oh, and actually, I can't boost this with the blade. Sorry, it has to be a melee attack, of course. <laughs> so, yeah, we're doing four damage to start, and we'll put the negative thing on him. Now, let's roll for the damage. Uh, what do we want? Red or purple for him? No, yellow is nothing. But hey, it gets him down to 12 out of 16. Not bad. And I put my negative token underneath him, although he's probably just going to move. <laughs> so, it might not matter very much. Um, and I got to flip this card. And a bug card. Maybe this Trader's Thoughts one. I don't have anything to uh, pay for it right now. And yeah, the Blast Step can get me another fire, which would be nice. All right, I have one basic action left. I could make him move next to me, but that would get him off of the negative space. I want him to stay there, right? Or I could, yeah, I think I'll strike the, the bat guy right next to me. So again, hoping for a purple or a gray. Oh, green is also nothing. Okay, so that's just two damage. Do I want to use my red to boost it to three? Three. Pretty good chance for the Shadow Piercer to finish him off if I do that. Sure. Let's use my red to boost it to three. This guy's only got two left. Oh, by the way, uh, reactions. I can hit somebody before they attack me, or after I attack, I can push somebody. But again, I don't want to push that guy off. Pushing this guy wouldn't really do anything. Let's let's wait and try to use that one. Although this would get me Ether to use a special attack faster, like my cleave ability. 
You know what? Uh, sure. I'm going to use Watch Your Back, <laughs> even though it's kind of useless. So I get to push this dude one after attacking him. I'll still keep him in range of the archer. I get a random ether. Oh, yes. Fire is what I like. How right, about Shadow Piercer? I don't have any ether. So I want to do Miasmic Arrow would put down their negative token and get a purple. Or Encant would give them a positive token for plus one damage and heal themselves. Ooh, and then if they did ambush. I like all of that. That seems pretty good. The only other one I can afford is Passing Nell. Two to three range, it would put an ice uh, token on somebody. By the way, there can only be one terrain token on a space. So like if I put ice on the same space as one of those healing tokens, it would override it. So now I don't think I want to do that. Although uh, ice, it will make you lose two movement whenever you try to move out of the space. Let's, 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 yeah, let's do Encant. So I'm going to put a positive token in space, plus one in heal when I attack, and get a random ether. And it's win. Do I like win? Ooh, win's what uh, what their bow uses. So they can get plus two range for one. That's cool. Okay, and then incant. I uh, have to flip a green or a red, which is like all my stuff at the top. Um, um, Devour prey. Yeah, I already got a lot of things that are going to cost things, so I think that's good. Oh, and actually, careful aim is another attack. That's nice. Okay, but now I'm going to do the ambush. So I'm uh, using the token that's on me. So I'm going to heal one back to full, back to nine. And then I'm doing a three damage attack at range two to three. And we'll finish off this person. It's three damage. So even if we roll badly, which we didn't, that's a plus zero. We would have defeated them anyway. But that removes the token I placed, and I would heal one from the effect. And then for my last action, I guess I'll bound because... Nothing left to heal. Don't need extra range. And I don't want to be next to people. So let's go like that, I guess. I don't know. All right, enemy time. And man, the boss is going to have armor next turn. So I guess I'll just try to finish off the other people. Oh, three. Skip that one entirely. One, two, three. So they're doing two to get at range two and hit for three. Uh, they're already there. So ouch, uh, three damage to start. Let's see how much extra they do. That is not the right die. That is definitely the round die, Mike. <laughs> Let's try that again. Uh, oh, no. Four damage? Ugh. Um, no, I can't do anything about that. I mean, they do have a lot of healing, so it might be okay. Five left. And if they get a turn, one of the items can heal you for three, so that would certainly help. And how about you, Xenix? What are you up to? Okay. They are doing the... Oh, they're not even moving. I guess I could have tried to get farther away, but yes, we're both going to take a one damage attack. And so for the archer, it's... <laughs> oh, God, two... And for the tank, it's just one. Oh, gosh. We're going to die. We're going to die. Uh, we do have another item, the Powdered Draken. That can be used to restore somebody to two health when they're knocked down. Rather not use it, though. All right, so let's see. What are you doing, boss? Okay, they're doing the Powered Dive. So they want to hit uh, as many people as possible, which means ah, they're going to leave my token and not suffer any negative consequences and hit both of us for a two attack. Oh, we really don't want green or red. Uh, okay, against the tank. Uh, that's a yellow. That's fine. Just two. And please, against the archer. Hey, okay, two. They have one life left. Oh, and true strike is down to seven. We need to heal. But we're going into round four, which means the boss is armored up again. So let's uh, kill some other people. All right, so the power ball is the most likely for the boss this time. I'm thinking maybe I push uh, the boss onto that negative space. And then, like, get next to him to attack that guy. And then if I can get the archer next to him as well, then he'll hit us for a super weak power ball and take a damage from that. Yeah, so I think that's what we're going to do. Well, in fact, I think it's better than I thought. Uh, See, so yeah, I'm going to seize the boss to move them one. And then skitter. Get back on that thing. And whoop. I mean, yeah, with my one fire, my sweeping cleave can hit the boss. Oh, that's right. The boss has, like, a billion armor. Why am I trying to hit the boss? Let me not use the cleave yet, then. I'll just do knock senseless. Sure. So that'll be a one damage attack at range one, and it'll leave fire behind, so if the uh, bat guy doesn't move, they'll take a damage at the end of their turn. And I get a random ether, which is going to be another fire. <laughs> I'm okay with that. But yeah, so we're going for an attack on this dude. Uh, that's gray, which is bad for me. So I do zero damage, one minus one, but I do still leave the fire behind on him. And then this one's flipping over to, oh, something they can give me or somebody else uh, armor. That sounds good. Then I think I'll use this reaction and save the one that like hits back for later. So after I attack, I can heal myself one. If I had a purple to dim, which I don't, I have all red, I would heal two. So I'm just healing one, and that's uh, the reaction for the true scale. And how about the shadow piercer? Well, I guess I wanted them to move, right? Although, gosh darn it. <laughs> this costs two to move in, so they can't get next to the boss like I wanted them to. That's okay, they can still shoot at the bat. With, I guess, ambush and careful aim, maybe? 
Sure, let's do careful aim first. So that's a two damage attack, and we'll get uh, ether die. It is another yellow. All right. And yellow is not good. So the bat's down to three life. Follow up with an ambush and a purple. Ooh, plus one. The bat's dead. Guess we didn't need the fire after all. And all that's left is... Ro oh, wait. Did I not heal myself at all? Hold on. Hold on. I mean, it's fine. I guess I didn't do re-knit. Um, I'll have them use their healing salve, which would mean that I would have to spend money buying it again if I wanted to. But for now... <laughs> Getting to four life instead of one seems like a smart move. All right, uh, Zinix is still alive, and that's a three. What the heck? Okay, so they are going to chew Cladrin. Chew Cladrin. I don't know. Uh, this is one where they put the healing thing beneath themselves, although they're still at full health. So they're going to move two to attack two. Ah, darn it, which means that they prefer to be here. How much damage? You but no, not plus one. Back down to one life. Ooh, but the enemy moved adjacent to me. Um, so it's a one damage attack, and they have one armor, so it's probably going to do nothing, and gray is minus one, so it's zero a lot, but whatever, they get an ether, that's what matters. So if they can somehow survive this turn, and get a green, they could, ooh, devour prey and get some life back, but that's going to depend on what the boss does. Two, they didn't get power ball, they got grasping tongues. Which is good, actually. They're going to heal themselves, but it means they're going to attack the tank instead of the archer, because this would have made them go against the farther person. And they're not going to move. Uh, so yeah, because they're already next to him. So they're attacking for three and then pushing two. I'm sorry, I moved the fire away, didn't I? Was it here? I think it was there. So yeah, they're attacking him for three first. Although because of the purple, it's minus one. So two base damage. And yellow. Oh, it's minus one for them. So that's only one damage. True scale to seven. And then pushing two. Um, doesn't really matter much. They do prefer to like push you into damaging effects if there are any, but here it didn't affect them. And they take one damage. I think that happens after the attack, before they put down the green. Or would they put down the green? No, I guess they, they would take the damage at the end of their attack or the end of their turn. I think they take the damage and then they put down the green. So they'll take one damage and heal one damage, I think, maybe. I'm slightly confused about the timing of that, but yeah, for now, we'll just say that's how it went. All right, that wasn't a too bad of a turn. And it's round five. We can wail on this dude again. And whale we shall, oh yes, whale we shall. Look at this. I'm going to use my seize ability to move the dude one. Hey, say hello to fire. I'm going to use my skitter ability to steal their healing place. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, should I let the... You know, I'll, I'll let the, the archer to go there. I'll go here. And then even though it's a bit of a waste, I'll use one of my red dice to do a sweeping cleave. And again, I'm not sure if I can immediately use the swords ability. I think I can. I mean, it's in my infuse now. So yeah, I think I'm going to boost it if it lets me. And I got two purple. It's plus one, three. Fire on my sword, four damage. Gets him down to eight, and they're on a fire space. I gotta flip this in another lizard card. Maybe this blast step. All right, so that was pretty awesome. And the awesome is not done. Oh no, because oh, I guess I gotta heal, don't I? Yeah, so let's uh, first use Renit. Oh, that's right, it's only on allies. Crud. That's okay. We'll be fine. I've got three dice. And I'm going to devour prey. Well, first I want to shoot him. So I'll ambush first. Um, just for a regular two damage attack. And two. Uh, purple. That's three. Heck yes. It's boss down to five. And now, uh, what was I going to do? Oh, use all three of these. Which, by the way, does mean that I have to throw some of these away. Because you can only have up to your ether max in infused dice as well. But that'll let me use a devour prey. I got to exhaust something else. So I only get one basic action. But I can leap four. Atta Ooh, attack for four, ignoring shields. I should have saved this for next turn. <laughs> but then I will heal two. I didn't use a purple die, unfortunately, so I'll only heal two. But yeah, it's pretty good. So leap four, attack for four, heal two. So I know where I'm leaping. Thanks for your little healing spots. I'm actually going to heal three. And let's see how the attack goes. Uh, minus one, so only attack for three. The dude's got two life left, but now I don't have any way to ignore uh, armor, so I'll probably have to survive two more rounds. Ooh, and I've got consume vitality. After an enemy suffers three or more damage, Heal one. If I had a blue to dim, which I don't, I could heal two. So wait, how much should I heal total? Two from the sucking his life force thing. One from consume vitality. And then one from the thing I'm ending on. Heck yeah. Back to five. Maybe I won't die. All right, what are our friends doing to respond to that? Dude's uh, throwing stones at us again. It's hitting both of us. Hopefully not too hard. Tank uh, took two damage. And Archer took one. 
Archers at four, tanks at five. Ooh, now look at this. Look at this. I think this is right. It says before you are attacked, make a range. This is at the tank, by the way. They didn't use reaction yet. Make a range one melee attack. It doesn't say against person attacking you, so I can hit the boss even if they might move away in a second. Oh, so I can kill him. Yeah, because I can. I got a red. I can dim. So it turns into a dim die, but I get plus one. Come on, come on. Just don't roll a gray or a blue for minus one. That's a friggin' blue. <laughs> well, still, still, it worked out well. Worked out well. Dude is down to one life. Just maybe not quite as well as I might have hoped. All right, anyway, and what's uh, the boss actually doing? He's doing it too. Oh, he's going to power dive to hit us both with a two damage attack. And then he'll be on fire and he will die. Because, <laughs> yeah, I don't think he wants to move. He's already in range of both of us. So uh, first on me, or not me, it's all me. Uh, that's just two damage to the tank. He's at three. And then on the archer, also two damage, also at uh, two. And I guess this little grove never learned. You shouldn't leap on top of your lava because into the pit you go. And this guy runs away, I guess. <laughs> and yay, we are victorious. So there you go. That was a basic scenario in Rove. There are a bunch more even in the content they sent me. Although, again, I got it pretty recently, so I didn't get a chance to play them all yet. I played about three times. So what do I like about the game? What am I not sure about yet? First of all, the core action system I like a lot. I like that even your basic actions are pretty cool and unique. And when you level up classes, which I think they said happens twice in the campaign, so you'll actually like change a new class, get a new board, get uh, new versions of these actions, those will become even more exciting. You saw this with Tales from the Red Dragon Inn, my favorite dungeon crawler of recent years, that that also had like cool basic actions that were more interesting for characters. So I like that. And this action system I think is nice. I like the management of the ether dice. I like building up and then doing big attacks attacks. That's always fun. And the double-sided card thing. I think it's pretty cool. This was uh, kind of in Buttons and Bugs. I enjoyed it there. It was also in, how was that one button shy fighting game? Battlecrest. Battlecrest had like cards that were flipping and you had to like try to get them together in interesting ways. So I enjoy that whole system and the reaction thing is cool too. So, so pretty much everything you're doing on your turn, including the management of the ether dice and then boosting like weapons and stuff with them is pretty fun. And I will say the later items tend to not be so restrictive in which elements work with them. So like the luck of the draw here with me rolling fire or not uh, is not as much of an issue in the later weapons I've seen. Additionally, the classes seem pretty diverse. Uh, the two I showed here were kind of the most basic martial ones, but they still have fun different things going on. But then uh, the other ones have like summoners and uh, boosters and other things. And again, as the classes level up, they're going to change even more. So I'm pretty happy about things on the hero side. And the terrain and like tactical picture is pretty cool too. I, I didn't use it as well as I could have, except for like putting down some fire and getting onto some healing spots. But the terrain seems pretty dynamic because a lot of people are putting down these positive and negative tokens and putting down like terrain things that have ongoing effects. And you also have these ether nodes and things. Now this one, uh, compared to some of the other missions I played, had way less sort of automatic damage terrain. So force movement effects and stuff were not quite as exciting, but other scenarios have had more of those kind of things. But in general, I, I think this could be fun as long as, you know, there's not too many types. I, I guess I did forget the one, but there's only a few more. There's like a, basically a force field one. There's the ice that I already mentioned. So especially once they have like player aids and stuff for the final version of the game, I don't think that'll be too tough. But I like dungeon crawlers and boss battlers where terrain and tactical positioning matters. And I think this is definitely the case here. And then we get to this. I love this. I said it recently with buttons and bugs, but I very much like predictability with some randomness in enemy activation. So this is in a way even better than buttons and bugs where it was just a one third chance for each activation what they might do. Here you have a very good likelihood that they're going to do the next thing a pretty good likelihood they might do the last thing and almost no chance, only one out of six, if they'll do the last thing. So you can really plan kind of what sort of things the enemies might do. Right now, the AI is dumb in what I would call a fun way because you can make them take like the worst possible path and walk through like fire and lava and stuff. So I appreciate all of that. Uh, the enemies seem diverse from what I've seen so far and like the different paths you take will send you against very different types of forces. So I, li I like all of this. This is the kind of AI system that I really appreciate. Now, potential concerns, let's get into some of those. Uh, first of all, this is very much a combat focused game. All the scenarios I've seen are about combat. I mean, sometimes you are defending, sometimes it's about survival, sometimes it is about like movement, but in general, you're just battling things. So uh, a lot of that is going to come down to how interesting the battlefields, the terrain, 
and like the enemies and how diverse the effects are. It could get a little bit stale. I have not felt that way in my plays so far, but they only sent me a very small portion of what's going to be in the game. So yeah, it remains to be seen if the battlefields and the variety among them will be dynamic enough to keep the game feeling fresh. Another thing I'm not sure about yet is leveling up. Now, the big class changes seem really awesome from the little bit I saw on uh, the TTS mod when they showed it to me, but I have not gotten to play them, so I can't really speak to them. You also unlock new action cards, which have like these little stars up there, which uh, certainly seem stronger, but not like ridiculously so. So I think the real like feeling of growth is going to come from those new classes. And then you also have new items and stuff. And I will say like the more powerful items are really more powerful. Like, look, this one, you can use power with any uh, infused gem, any infused ether. And then you can break armor and push with your entire attack. So like they get really strong. So it might be the kind of battle game where the items are one of the main sources of growth, which is going to appeal to some people and others not as much. But I think it is pretty cool. And again, you can use them more consistently with your ether and it's going to be kind of an interesting resource management thing. So, yeah, it sort of remains to be seen, especially with those classes, uh, how interesting leveling up will be and how exciting that'll be. And right now it looks like for the big level ups, they only happen like every two or three scenarios, which is, you know, an OK pace. Again, we'll see if that feels fast enough. I don't know. Now, another concern that I know is going to bother people is the luck element. And that's most pronounced right now in the damage, because you saw the majority of effects, both from the enemies and the allies, is doing like the two damage range is sort of the average. And it's a pretty huge difference, at least in my opinion, if you get a minus one and do only one damage, especially when they have armor, or get a plus one and do three damage. Like that, that's a fairly big swing when these health values are so low. Now, I imagine as you go to later scenarios and you are dealing bigger damage with stronger attacks, you have more items and stuff, probably your life totals and the enemy life totals will increase and these like minor little number differences won't matter as much. But certainly in the early scenarios, it feels like luck of the roll is pretty impactful. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It could be more exciting for the play, but certainly something to be aware of if you are uh, randomness averse. And finally, the narrative. I didn't even read the narrative before this video because I'm not quite sure where it's going yet. I have a very small portion of the game. But from what they've described to me, it sounds like the choices you make. So basically, after the tutorial, you can choose to go one direction or the other, and you'll have a totally different set of missions. But then apparently you'll return to like some of these earlier missions because the problem that you didn't deal with has now gotten worse. And you'll have like similar situations, but things have gotten worse and have grown out of control. And now you got to battle like tougher monsters. So, you know, my sort of branching paths, choose your own adventure self is getting excited by that. We'll see if it uh, is going to pan out in an exciting way. But I like the narrative I've read so far. The choices are tough. Like, it's not obvious, oh, we should do A, we should do B. Like, so far, all the choices that are presented seem pretty interesting. But, you know, certainly this is not a narrative-heavy game. <laughs> it, is, it is not an exploratory game. It is about fight, fight, fight. That's the focus. But, yes, nothing in the narrative is, like, pushing me away. I think it's pretty interesting so far. All right, so that is a little taste of Rove. I think as of the airing of this video, it should be on crowdfunding. So go check it out, see what you think. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good gaming, and I'll see you at the next stop.